Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the eighth annual Vanguard Court Watch Dinner. Is that amazing? At one time, they thought the Vanguard was just a small blog that was going to go away overnight, and the Vanguard and Vanguard Court Watch proved the doubters wrong. And because of supporters such as yourself and others that can't be here tonight with us, the Vanguard is successful and it's growing stronger every day. And we thank you so much for your continued support, involvement, and articles and letters that you write. We want to continue to encourage you to send in those articles and letters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I want to introduce a very special guest that we're honored to have tonight, our first guest. He is somebody that has integrity, he has compassion, commitment, and he loves Davis. And I know his son does too. We've known him for many years, and we are very, very fortunate to call him Mayor of Davis. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Brett Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, for that. Uh a very generous introduction. Uh, so David uh, has do been doing this event, uh, as you've heard, for uh, quite some number of years. And when he reached out to me and asked whether I'd be willing to sponsor it, I, I said, yeah. Ab I said, ab ab there you go. Uh, so anyway, thank you for the generous introduction, uh, Cecilia. I, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, David, is David has been doing this event for many years. And when he reached out to me to sponsor the event, even though I knew that actually there was a time conflict, and that's my excuse for scooting out the door in a minute or two, I, I did want to sponsor it because these events are very important. And they're, they're very important because of the, the broad aspects of them. And for those of you who have been to some of them, you know that the speakers have very compelling stories with specifics that make you understand sort of what's working and what's not working. And anyway, I think the Davis Vanguard itself, in terms of the website, has had that effect here locally for the city of Davis. So I know in these events, we have a lot of visitors from outside of the Davis area. But I can say, as a Davis resident, the Davis Vanguard has really made a difference in our community because it provides an easy, accessible forum for a variety of views. And uh, and, and so David was really one who was the first to really have a professionalized blog, which really allowed residents to submit information, but for him to convey information. And as some of you know, who have been here for 10 plus years, there really was a little bit of a vacuum in terms of transparency uh, about some of the things going on in our community. So I'm really glad to have the opportunity to support David in his ongoing efforts. And he often does this, but I will just sort of steal a little bit of his narrative. It's pretty amazing to me that it started out with David just sitting in his living room, writing these articles at uh, 3, 4, and 5 in the morning to where it is today, where he sits in his living room and, or, and writes his blog articles at 3, 4, 5 in the morning. But he has several interns who cover the Yolo County Courthouse. He has several interns who provide coverage from a, um, a, a broader array of things. And really, it's become uh, what I would consider an indispensable part of our community. And I know sometimes we agree, and sometimes we disagree <coughs> with some of the idea, ideas on the Vanguard, but I absolutely believe that more transparency and more accessibility to the information is very important. And so uh, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for, uh, I consider David my friend. I've known him for probably a, a dozen to 14 years, I would say. And um, you know, thank you for hosting this, and I hope that there are many, many more. Uh, thank you.
And thank you, Brett Lee. So um, I'm going to take this opportunity uh, to also uh, recognize a few other folks uh, in the audience and also some of our uh, main sponsors for this event. Um, so uh, Supervisor uh, Don Saylor is here in the back. And uh, Supervisor Jim Provenza. And we also have uh, Davis Mayor Pro Tem Gloria Partida. And uh, school board member Bob Poppengay. And we also uh, are very honored to have uh, the public defenders from both Yolo and Sacramento County here today. So we have Tracy Olson and uh, Steve Garrett. And of course, uh, the elections are now what? Uh, a little over a week away now. Uh, so we have a few candidates out in the audience as well. Uh, we have uh, school board candidate Joe Denunzio. <laughs> school board candidate Cindy Pickett. <laughs> Melissa Moreno, who is uh, running for the county board, uh, took ill, but she was here earlier. <laughs> and then also running for the county board out in West Sacramento is Maria Grijalva. And we also have a former mayor, Ann Evans. And former city council member, Mike Harrington, had to leave early. Um, and so um, I'm going to introduce um, the uh, National Lawyers Guild from Sacramento, who are also uh, big sponsors of this event, um, and they're going to give uh, a few quick words here. Um, who's going to do the actual? Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Kim. I'm the president of National Lawyers Guild, Sacramento chapter. I'm putting my green hat here so you guys know this is us. Um, in case you didn't know what National Lawyers Guild does, we're the oldest bar association in the United States. We were formulated in 1937 in response to the American Bar Association being a very conservative, all-white bar association. And at the time, we had the labor movement that needed some advocacy from a multiracial group and so four attorneys at that time formed in New York City, and within two weeks we were spread all throughout the East Coast, and here we are today. And during the, <laughs> right. And for the past 80 years, we just celebrated our 80th year anniversary of our existence. We've been on the correct side of history every single time with all of the issues that have, you know, hit us. I don't want to say right, you got that right. <laughs> um, hit us from all sides uh, throughout our country and as well as internationally. So we've been involved with the, like I said, the labor movement, we've been against world, war, world wars, we've been against invasion of foreign countries and occupations, you know, we've been against, um, you know, surveillance by the FBI. We actually won a lawsuit case against them in 1989 for um, monitoring us, trying to infiltrate us and dismantle the National Lawyers Guild for all of our work. And um, most recently, we've taken on the task of battling police brutality. So, um, <laughs> and of course, tonight's theme, immigrant rights. So as we know, the, um, one of the worst things that have happened during this current administration is how uh, much our immigrant brothers and sisters are harmed in the past year. And I was reviewing some, some articles to try to get you know, refreshed for this uh, little remark, but I just was shocked all over again when I read in a, a Time article that was released in uh, January of this year that it took after six presidents for this current administration to start 
pointing out to certain nationalities and having them leave. So it is essentially a, an illegalization of our immigrant brothers and sisters. And um, that was earlier before we then learned of the tragedy of splitting families apart and having the UN make remarks against us. And I don't even want to start depressing all of us with everything after that, but um, it's really a question of where do we draw the line? You know, um, that same article asked 170 million people in the world, and um, I'm sorry, people all over the world, and 170 million of those answered that they would like to live somewhere else in the world if they could. So the United States has had a history of welcoming immigrants, as we know, and it's just a tragedy that this is happening. So I'm very glad that the uh, Davis Vanguard has made this the theme for tonight. We're very happy and honored to sponsor uh, this event. And um, we, as National Lawyers Guild, will continue to fight as much as we can to defend immigrant rights. We've hosted many Know Your Rights trainings throughout the year. We've hosted fundraisers to raise money to get the uh, detained families out of uh, custody. And we will continue to fight together. Thank you very much. So who here enjoyed uh, their food tonight? All right. Well, you can thank uh, the Yes on L folks over there at the green table. They generously sponsored the food tonight uh, from uh, Tommy J's um, here in Davis. So thank you very much. I would like uh, the Vanguard Court Watch interns who are in the house to uh, just come up here for a moment. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Can you come up, Fiona? <laughs> I know, I know. Hold on one sec. She'll, she'll be right back. <laughs> I just want to uh, recognize the work, and, and uh, these young ladies here are actually only a small handful of our overall interns. I think we have 10 right now um, who are going into the court and monitoring what is going on. And if you've been following the Vanguard lately, there's a lot going on in the courts. Uh, so they, they have their work cut out for them. So thank you. And uh, all right. <laughs> And I'd also like to uh, thank Danny, who is our intern coordinator. And then in the back uh, at the wine table is Helen, uh, who's my office assistant. And at the NLG table is uh, my Sacramento Court Watch uh, guy, uh, Cress Felucci. And uh, Natalie is in the back. She's a Vanguard board member, and so is Cecilia, who you already met. <laughs> so uh, it, it takes more and more people to get the Vanguard done these days, so I could not do it without the tireless work of all these individuals and, and many others who were not able to make it tonight. Okay, um, so interns, you may go. <laughs> So um, I'm going to invite uh, Denise up here, um, who's representing the ACLU, also a big sponsor. And of course, without the work of the ACLU, uh, we'd probably all be in jail. So, uh, so Denise. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. And hi, I don't have prepared remarks. I just wanted to direct your attention to the ACLU table. Please, if you haven't stopped by, come on by. We have pocket constitutions for you. It never hurts to have a pocket constitution with you. We also have membership forms if you are interested in joining. And just to encourage people's involvement, we have a very robust uh, local ACLU. And it's open to anybody. You can come check it out and see what's going on locally and in Northern California and, of course, nationally. And those meetings happen the third Wednesday of every month over at the uh, clubhouse at the Lakeshore Apartments. But um, I encourage you all to get involved. I was really happy to hear that there was such a a local active chapter. So if you have any questions, you can, there's several ACLU folks floating around, so thanks. Now anyone who came to my first event, I don't know if there's anyone here, but Jasmine was a tiny baby and I spent the entire time uh, holding her as I spoke. So uh, she's now almost nine years old. <laughs> oh, oh, my program disappeared. Um, yes. So I just wanted to point everyone's attention to the inside of the program um, because we had 82 people sponsor this event, which is by far a record for us. Um, so rather than reading all of the names off, uh, which will take an hour, um, I'm, I'm merely pointing it out. And so later today, please read everybody's name so that uh, they get the proper recognition. Okay, um, so uh, now I would like to introduce our uh, first uh, main speaker. And uh, Chuck Pacheco I've known uh, for uh, a while now. Um, I first met Chuck uh, when he was one of the attorneys that volunteered uh, to represent the defendants in the gang injunction trial, which started back in 2010. And for those of you uh, that uh, don't remember, um, the, uh, the judge in that case decided that uh, because it wasn't a criminal case, um, that uh, the, the people that were served under the gang injunction were not entitled to a uh, public defense um, and so um, I think it was six or eight attorneys volunteered their time uh, to represent these individuals who were going to have their liberties severely curtailed, uh, one of whom was Chuck Pacheco. And then um, last summer I was happening to read uh, the news, and actually I think uh, Cress um, had broken the story of the individual uh, who was arrested uh, in the Sacramento courtroom by ICE. And I read the Sacramento Bee, and there was Chuck Pacheco. And so I, I called up Chuck, and I said, hey, do you want to come and, and speak on this at our event? And he said, sure. Uh, so here he is, and without any further ado, uh, welcome Chuck Pacheco. nine-year-old and I think they are they've met in on occasion all right my name is Chuck Pacheco I'm a criminal defense attorney I practice and act, actually I practice is it working all right actually I practice I pra um, practice throughout this uh, northern California um, I have uh, probably tried 30 or so murder cases in my career and my office is in uh, Sacramento um, first of all, maybe I have a little t uh, different take on this, but hey, you know, our country is a, a, a country of laws, all right? And the ACLU pointed out they have this pocket uh, constitution. You know, 
It's always nice to know that Constitution because that Constitution is a protection of, for us against the government. A lot of people don't understand that, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> and, and the fact that uh, our country is a country of laws, those who, in someone's, some people's opinion, don't follow the law and they engage my services, I give them 100% and don't mess with my clients. Like the court system did on August the 22nd in Department 8 in Sacramento, California, a person named Judge Brown, an idiot. What happened that day is the day before, on the, about August 21st or so, I got this guy, well, his name is all over the paper, so his name is um, Antreveris uh, Cabreros. So he comes to me and he says, hey, Chuck, um, you know, I got picked up on uh, some drug charges. Um, would you represent me? Of course I will. After we squared away business, and we did. And he says, but I'm concerned. I'm, what are you concerned about? He says, I'm undocumented. I said, okay. He says, what are my chances of uh, leaving that courthouse? I said, well, I said, it's never happened in Sacramento where uh, ICE has taken someone from the courtroom. Never. But in being a lawyer, you always have that other side, right? And you say, but it doesn't mean this won't be the first time. So I told him, I said, I'll see you in court the next day. It was a 10 o'clock appearance in Department 8. And I said, meet me in the front. Don't go into the courtroom. Meet me in the front. So what, what occurred was um, I show up at court, and I have 8.30 appearances in Sacramento. And so I wandered by Department 8, and I checked the calendar, and I said, oh, there he is. Okay. No warrants. Nothing to worry about, right? And um, so I sit out periodically in front of the department. Hey, well, I see these two guys. Now, has anybody spotted an undercover cop? <laughs> yeah, they look like undercover cops, right? I said, ah, oh, come on. You know, these guys, they just, they're just not right. You know, they're looking one direction all the time, the way my client would be coming. So I figured these guys were immigration. So my guy shows up, and I go into the courtroom. Well. This is a sanctuary state, right? I ain't nothing to worry about. You know, I mean, the deputies in here, the judges, and uh, Sacramento's a sanctuary city, right? I got nothing to worry about, but I'm looking around and, hey, you guys, what? You have a zipper on zipper. How come everybody's looking at me? How come everybody's looking at me? The deputies and stuff. I said, hmm, thumbs up. So I go about my business. Come back, and uh, around, um, uh, those two guys are still sitting outside in the hallway. So I come back, and I go out into this public lobby deal. And so my guy comes. Now he's shaved. I said, good on you. So he's shaving, and I said, and he comes with his mom. I said, you stay here until I tell you to come. And I said, and then when I leave here, about 45 seconds later, you come into the court. Okay? So, and he does that. He sits there, and everybody's looking around. They don't see my guy, right? Well, there he is with his mama. But they can't recognize him. So, we start the calendar. The court is, uh, Judge um, Brown calls the, calls the court, um, and they call it in order. The deputy DA is uh, introduced. I'm introduced. So, deputy, hey, on the 1030 calendar, page 7, Antreveris Cabreras. So I say, good morning, Your Honor. Chuck Pacheco representing Mr. Antreveris uh, Cabreras, the court. Good morning. Now, this judge didn't like me from Jump Street because... I don't think he's funny. And so uh, he says, uh, have you received a copy of the complaint, Mr. Pacheco? I have not. Oh, and then somebody brings it to me. Oh, I, I have it now. The court, all right, Mr. Pacheco, I, uh, I acknowledge receipt of the complaint with his full reading stipulate my client's been advised of his rights. Enter, please. I just have a, I said, I, and, then, and then, well, spider uh, senses go up, right? I says, judge. I have this strange feeling something is going to happen. So we can set another September 19th uh, date for further proceeding in this case. All right, well, the court. All right, well, let's do this then. If, if you're fine with not entering pleas at this time, we'll simply set it for a settlement conference on September the 19th. Are you okay with that? Yes. All right. You said a strange feeling something's going to happen. Is this, is this the gentleman? All right, this judge is not supposed to know anything about what's going on, right? You, you'll see through this deal. So what happened is, 
because I had made that comment about the strange feeling. And so he says, is this the gentleman? And the bailiff says, yes, it is, the court. Oh, and I say, I just have a strange feeling. Oh, court says, I don't know for sure, but I feel something's brewing. The court, I just, I'm, I was just worried you had kind of uh, like saw some image where all of a sudden I collapsed on the bench or something. I says, no. See, he thinks he's funny. And so the guy said, the court says, good, all right. I'm feeling a bit better. I said, hmm. He says, hey, I hear there might be a federal warrant. Is that right, deputy? Yes. All right? So here I'm sitting like Homer, and, and these guys know what the hell's happening. Nobody tells me. In our system, and we have defense attorneys here, what happens is that if we know a client of ours is going into custody, we give the deputy a heads up. Hey, he's going into custody. He's either cool with it or he's a little skittish. And vice versa. They'll tell us, hey, we got to... Now, these guys didn't do that crap. So, sanctuary city, sanctuary state, yeah. Well, whose side was the court on? So the bailiff says yes. So the court says, all right, well, go ahead and have him um, uh, remanded at this time. Well, what do you mean, judge? What the hell, you know? So I say, well, can I, let me ask you this. What is the federal warrant for, if I may ask the, uh, the court? A violation of the federal law. I said, oop, no, no. <laughs> what? Yeah, he says, violation of federal law. So I said, oops, which one? We see, I'm an old guy, I'm 75, right? Do I care what they think anymore? No. <laughs> I, I can't, I'm, I'm being respectful, but you know, you play the game, I will too. So the court said, well, given this cha uh, charge here, I'm going to guess it's somewhat Somewhere in the title of, uh, of 21 U.S. Code. He didn't even know the codes. Mr. Pacheco, well, does that interfere with my 919 date? The court says, well, I think it would depend upon if they kept him. Uh, um, when the DA has to be, uh, do a gut check about whether they want to do a, a, a writ of ad pros, uh, proquendum. It's a Latin word. It means bring him to the right jurisdiction. Um, to have Mr. Ontiveros here, or whether the federal matter sort of carries the day. I, I know this, I'm going to go off the record, and we're going to have him uh, go into custody, and we're going to see where, oh, is ICE uh, taking him now? Because now, I'm standing up there at the podium, right? My guy's right here, and here's the bar. You know, you don't pass that bar unless you pass the bar, right? That's what attorneys, right? <laughs> so these two jerks come past the bar. And they're click, click, hooking them up. So I turn on this little guy. I said, what's this about? He said, we got a federal warrant. Title, oh, title so-and-so and so-and-so. I go, hey, I, I don't know the federal codes. Just tell me what it is. Illegal reentry after deportation. I said, okay. So... So they, he didn't like that. Well, I think I would, okay, but, 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 all right. Is I, yes, yes, they are. The bailiff says, yes, yes, they, they're here. So let me ask you a question. So I know from now on, I'm asking the court, from, let me ask you a question, Judge. So from now on, so I know how to advise my clients. Are we take, talking uh, in Sacramento that if a guy shows up in court that ICE can take him? Is that it? The court, I actually, Mr. Pacheco, that is an outstanding point. I know, boy. That really is an interesting morning. This really is an interesting morning. This is a judge, right? He can't figure it out. So I say, see, because that, and he says, no, let me go. I get it. I said, pardon me? He says, I get it. Pacheco, all right, so I'd like to know. And then he goes off the record talking to somebody, not me. Then he comes back. Um, back on the record. I want to defend it here in custody here for a minute, and I'm going to pass the matter, and we're going to conference the matter for a moment uh, when I have an opportunity. And so we come, that's 1022, 1030, we come back on calendar, and he says, all right, Mr. Pacheco, I was obviously a bit unprepared, no kidding, <laughs> to, to address some of the questions that you uh, were posing to the court at that time. I'm now in a better position to address these questions. The defendant has a federal warrant uh, arrest for 18 U.S.C. 1326. These are criminal charges have been brought by the United States Attorney's Office for a person who has illegally reentered the country committing a crime. So they have a warrant 
uh, arrest warrant. That's, uh, that's different than what I was worried about. I recall kind of earlier, uh, there was some kind of headlines about people who, will, who, who with ICE come, they come into the courthouse and they are eligible for deportation, getting kind of swooped up and taken away. Because my boss, the ultimate one, the Chief Justice of the uh, State Supreme Court had denounced that as a practice. That's not what we have. He, he kind of misread the article. So this gentleman here uh, has an arrest warrant for a federal crime. And so ordinarily it wouldn't happen in the courtroom. Ordinarily it happens out in the hallway or something. And it's just the way things played out. When you raised to me, is something happening right now, that kind of caught me a bit unaware as I was trying to do some solid in terms of trying to explain what might be happening. But that's where we are now. So I certainly, yes, if the question is, are there times when arrest warrants have been issued by the authority, whether it is local, state, or federal agency, can these arrests uh, be executed in this department or in this courthouse? Of course. This happens regularly. I have cases all the time where deputy brings me a warrant for $50,000, $25,000 out of Placer County, whatever it might be. I'm not a warrant-free zone. So we'll go ahead then. I'll keep the September 19th date for this case. That's all I have juris uh, jurisdiction over. It's only my federal, it's, it's not my federal warrant. I'm not a federal magistrate judge, nor do I ever want to be, okay? So I said, um, hmm, okay, except it's a lifetime employment, and you don't have to worry about uh, elections. The court, no, magistrate is every eight years. I said, oh. And then you have um, plea, um, the court, and then you have to plea to um, district court judges, and that's a rough one. I said, all right, just to make a couple of comments in saying, you know, if, there, if that were the case, and the act that occurred was 14 years ago, I find it disingenuous that all of a sudden my client shows up in court this morning and for something that happened 14 years ago and he's here, the court, and then he, cu then he cut me off. All right, so that's what occurred in court. Well, of course, papers called because it's kind of interesting, it was pretty cool. And so the papers call, and so in my comment, I made a comment, I said the judge was weak and the judge lost control of his courtroom. If you were a judge, we'd like to hear that from a punk attorney. But, yeah, that's the way I felt, right? And so when I say that he, um, he misread his boss, as he says, right? Because um, Chief Justice um, Tani Cantil Sakai, good friend of mine, I know her well, you know, and, and, and she states, and I'm, I'm sure maybe, maybe you know it, but I'm just going to brief it, where she was deeply concerned about reports from some of our trial courts that immigrant agents appear to be, immigration agents appear to be stalking undocumented immigrants in our courthouses and make arrests. Our courthouses serve as a vital form of, to ensure access to justice and protection, public safety. Courthouses should not be used as bait in the necessary enforcement of our country immigration laws. Then she goes on to say, hey, it's going to have a chilling effect on people who have uh, personal injury, landlord tenant, divorce, why should we go and report crimes to the cops? They're gonna uh, bust us. Um, and so it's, it's well laid out in what Connie can, can, can deal. So Judge Brown doesn't know how to read or his comprehension is not very well. So then he makes a smart remark to the newspapers about, oh, he was just following the law and if he has a warrant, um, uh, that you know he has no he has no choice. So, a couple days later, I get exoneration. I mean, I, I don't need it. I don't care. I don't want it. But the presiding judge stated, arrests that occur inside the state courthouse and especially inside a courtroom are disruptive of court proceedings. This is uh, Judge D'Alba. Our courts regret the decision by ICE to execute an arrest warrant inside one of our courtrooms. The fear of immigration um, arrest deters witnesses and crime victims from coming forward to participate in the prosecution of crimes and the resolution of child custody, landlord, tenant, personal injury, and other claims. And um, he's indicated that uh, uh, they were going to do, 
discuss this matter with ICE so this crap does not happen again. So that's our government at work, right? And then you would think, that's it, right? Oh, wait, wait, wait. So, you know, I'm, like I say, I'm an old guy. You know, I'm 75. Hey, I don't do my face deal or uh, <laughs> Twitter or <laughs> stuff like that, right? So, so, my, so my business partner, youngster, she's um, like 32, right? And she gets these things like Link, Business Link or something like that, right? And... Um, <laughs> What do you call it? Uh, link it. Okay, that's it. Right. Link, link it. A uh, Lincoln ab. Right. So she runs it. See all searches. Department of Justice. Mm. Department of Homeland Security. Mm. Ice. Hey, if they want to play, we can play, but they're not going to find anything on me because I don't have all these deals. But. That's the kind of overreaching that when a defense attorney, when we get involved in this kind of stuff, it just pees us off, okay? <laughs> and we, I, we have kids here. And so, so that's, uh, that's my story, and that's my immigration story, and I'm still doing uh, sword fights with this judge, and he's asked another case to say, let's go and conference this case. No, I don't, I don't, I don't conference. He said, and he had a deputy come up to me one time, the judge wants to see you in the chambers. I said, for what? He wants to conference the case. I said, I'm not going. She says, he ordered you. I said, no, he didn't. Get out of here. I'm not going back. <laughs> so anyway, that's my story. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I'm now going to introduce Supervisor Don Saylor. Thank you, David. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be able to introduce the, the next speaker who's going to come up here in just a second. Uh, I just I want to congratulate the Davis Vanguard and David Greenwald and his team for this ongoing series. This is important material that we're being, uh, that's being shared with us tonight, just as last year's and the year before. It's very important for us. You know, there's a, there's a concept called cathedral thinking. And the idea is that you may, the work that we do today is work that will stand, that must stand the test of time. If you, if, you, if you think of the cathedrals in the great cities of Europe or the temples in Asia around the world, you know that people designed those buildings who never lived to see them completed. So they were doing something for the future, something that would go far beyond uh, their, their generation. The builders didn't know the designers. The Constitution of the United States was signed off on in, in uh, 1787. That's 231 years ago. The people, the great thinkers who put that Constitution together were not perfect people. They made mistakes. They made compromises. They knew that it wouldn't be easy. They knew that what they were doing would, to stand, would have to stand the test of time and would be shaped in the times to come by those who follow. They would be shaped to this time by us. The Constitution's only true protection is the people. There's no insurance policy on the Constitution. We must stand up in these times ahead to be sure that that the work that came before us and all of the struggles that we have been through as a country uh, will, will continue and will stand the test of time. <laughs> so my colleague Jim Provenza is here with, with us tonight and, and Jim is also a sponsor of this event. Uh, Jim and I have been able, working with a group of people here in Yolo County, several of you are here in the room, uh, we call it, we've called it Safe YOLO. Uh, we've built a proclamation, a resolution about a year and a half ago now that we call Safe and Welcoming Communities. Uh, that YOLO County will be a safe place for all of, it, all of our residents, for everyone who comes here. This, that was, and we got, we, we, said we achieved the magic number of three, uh, which is uh, when a five person body is making a vote, then you need three. So we've achieved the magic number of three on that one. And this year, 
uh, in response to, and Jim does such a wonderful job of describing his, his gut-wrenching take on the family separations that have happened along the border that I, I would love for him to tell you that, but just, just to tell you, this year we followed that resolution with another that is family protection and we pledged the support of Yolo County's advocacy efforts and all of the, all of the creative energies that we can take to fight the family separations that are happening along the border. And it's, a, it's in that spirit that we then followed with a budget appropriation to, to set aside a fairly small amount of money, $100,000, to invest in legal support for refugee and immigrant cases that come to our attention here in Yolo County. So we're joining the city of Sacramento in attacking that issue at a local level. So these are important steps, they're small steps. So in the context of that, to have the opportunity, to have the opportunity, thank you, Ann, to have the opportunity to introduce Holly Cooper is such a, such a seamless and wonderful privilege today. Holly has fought for the rights of immigrants and refugees for more than 20 years. She's a co-director of the Immigration Law Clinic, which if, as, as I know she's gonna share with us, it's such a treasure, this place. It's unique in the country. Uh, Holly is a UC Davis uh, uh, College of uh, King Hall alumni. She joined the faculty here in 2006. Uh, this is, uh, she'll tell you all about the Immigration Law Clinic and other things. But I wanted to, to kind of get a sense of, of all the matters that Holly is involved in, because she's, she's right there in the trenches. She's talking to people in law classes and, and other attorneys all over the country all of the time. But she's also in prisons. She's also going to visit detention centers and places where kids are being held. Uh, she's involved in so many cases that you can't hardly, you can't hardly keep up with her. And today she posted, and on her uh, I think uh, Chuck uh, said that so, so he kind of made, made a little joke about the different kinds of electronic social media. Well, Holly's out there on Twitter this morning, and she's saying, I'm supposed to speak tonight, and my mind keeps shifting on which horror to highlight. Threats to free press, hate crimes, police brutality, prisons, denial of refugee protections, oppression of our LGBTQ community, and now there's a slaughter at the synagogue called Tree of Life. So what better way to honor all of those who have suffered than to actually hear uh, where the trenches are and to hear from Holly Cooper. So Holly, please come up and share. I am going to a costume party later, so. <laughs> Um, but I'm also wearing this in honor of my Russian grandfather who came here as a refugee and this is a Russian dress, unless you thought it was like a, like a salsa dress, I don't know. Um, but he, he came here as a child and he came here at the age of six years old as a refugee because his father uh, resisted the Tsar soldiers at the time and refused to uh, heed the, the high road and uh, through, through his own dignity, unfortunately, um, ended up in a, in a struggle, in a physical struggle with the soldiers, and it forced their entire family to flee to this country, at which point my great-grandparents were too poor uh, to protect my grandfather and had to abandon him in an orphanage where he was raised. And so it's with that calling that I have uh, dedicated most of my career, if not all of my career, uh, to defending the rights of children who, like my grandfather, came here uh, with nothing and uh, you know, had to endure the indignity of detention and processing and also starting to work at a young age. He, he began working uh, for Western Telegraph at the age of eight and worked um, up until it closed down. Uh, I think he was the longest running employee. Um, <clears throat> sure. Um. How about that? That's easier for me, yeah. Well, Beyonce now. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the, what I wanted, I, I, David wanted me to talk about uh, our role at the clinic because I think that oftentimes people see me and, and, and associate me with the clinic. But I also wanted to recognize that our law clinic is a part of UC Davis Law School and it's a teaching, a place where we teach. 
And the students are, in fact, the heart and soul of the clinic. And without them, we would not be able to achieve any of the victories that we have. And we have many of the students, I see, well, not many, but we have some of the students who are in uh, the audience tonight. And uh, we appreciate your presence. Even some former alums of the clinic are in the audience. Um, but as, as the director of the clinic, I, people oftentimes think I work at a clinic, and they think I work at a health clinic. <laughs> I don't, um, although I feel like it is an ER tent. Um, but the, the work of our, our clinic is to, first and foremost, teach students how to sue the federal government and how to defend the rights of immigrants in court. And it is our students who are standing in court and writing the briefs in interviewing the oppressed communities for which we can base our, loss, our lawsuits on. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that this is not about me. This is about our work is really a testament to an educational model at UC Davis that is working and is in large part the heart and soul of the student's work. Um, but one of the cases I wanted to highlight um, because David asked me to was our work with detained children. And in that capacity, Four years ago, I got a call from a lawyer saying, you have to come inside of this detention center. Children are here for two and three years, and they're not getting out. And I thought, OK. Um, and I had left work on the border. I worked on the border for six years, and I worked with detained children. And I had to get out because it was so emotionally grueling. And I promised myself I would never get back in. But when I heard that children in my backyard weren't getting out of custody, I said, I need to get back in. And so about four years ago, I dedicated our clinic uh, to being a counsel to the, what's called the Flores Settlement Agreement, uh, which the President Trump has tweeted about, written executive orders about, and has basically called an all-out war on the settlement agreement. So what is a settlement agreement? It, this, again, is important to recognize that this settlement agreement is named after a child who in 1985 sued the federal government for better conditions of confinement for immigrant children in custody. I mean, if you can imagine, like, 14 years old and suing the federal government in a class action. And unfortunately, she didn't win. The case went to the Supreme Court, but was remanded partially. And at that point, the federal government realized um, it, it should probably come forth and settle. So they settled, and they, they came to terms of basic, basic human rights uh, for children in detention, like the right to school, like the right to be detained in the least restrictive environment, uh, the right to have state licensing standards govern these detention facilities. And she settled that. Janice Lisette Flores settled that case uh, in 1997. And it was in four years ago that our clinic became involved in overseeing that the federal government was uh, doing its end of the bargain with the settlement agreement. Uh, and in such, we have enormous, enormous oversight powers into these children's uh, prison camps. Uh, sometimes we don't like to use the word detention, but, um, but, uh, but, but for, for lack of a better uh, word, sometimes we often use the word imprisonment um, for what the children are enduring. Um, there are currently 13,000 children in this country in detention, imprisonment, internment camps. What, what word we choose to use I think is important, um, and the children always choose to use the word uh, either cage or prison. Um, and when we go, we have complete access to these facilities. We can show up to any of the hundreds of detention facilities as Flores Council, ask for a list of the names, and ask to speak to all the children detained. So in the last few years, we've flown all over the United States and interviewed countless children about the conditions of confinement. So this, this settlement agreement is, is very important because Trump has, it, it, it only permits the federal government to hold children for 20 days inside of a non-licensed, a non-child welfare licensed facility, like a family, family uh, imprisonment, uh, family in prison, prison camp, excuse me. And um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the heart and soul of this, uh, Trump has said, well, it's because of that Flores settlement agreement that we have to separate children because we can't keep them in prison with their parents. So we, because of the Flores settlement agreement, at 20 days, we have to rip that child uh, from the mother or father's arms when in fact they could release the family unit and have the ultimate federal power to do so at any time. So he, this summer, I thought I was gonna take some time off and I was gonna paint and I was gonna relax. And then Trump, the Trump administration actually authored an executive order 
commanding its agents to dismantle this settlement agreement so that they could create family uh, prison camps along the Texas and Arizona border. Um, the next day after the executive order, the government in our case filed a motion to modify the settlement agreement to permit family imprisonment. Um, so my, my entire summer was upended. <laughs> um, um, and there were no students around. Um, so uh, so uh, needless to say, I didn't, I didn't have the, the, the relaxing summer that I'd wanted. Um, but right now, um, the federal government has lodged another attack. And that is, they have, they have what are called proposed regulations that will try to squash out the settlement agreement. And so we're engaged in um, litigation, working 18-hour days uh, to make sure that that does not happen. Um, but what has, what has this, why is this important? It's important because um, we have visibility right now. We have lawyers that can go in and talk to the children and understand what is going on inside of these detention camps. Um, what we've gathered in the last four years of information um, is that we have seen since the family separation, and I'm not just talking about family separation between mom and child, I'm talking about brother and sister. I'm talking about uncle. Um, there's all types of different family relationships that are being separated, that are not being acknowledged. Um, in light of that, we're seeing increased forced sedations because children are having psychiatric breakdowns when they're separated from parents. We've, we've gotten declarations from people who've witnessed children as young as six and seven years old who are being forcibly sedated because of the psychiatric um, uh, meltdowns that the children are having uh, with the forced separations. Um, we've seen suicide attempts at record high. There was, a, there was a period of time where we were getting almost three or four calls a week on my home phone from children who were telling me that they were on the verge of suicide because they were so desperate to be reunited with family or to get out of uh, detention. Um, we're also seeing prolonged increasing detention times for children. Um, we used to see an average of like, you know, three to four weeks. That has tripled, okay, according to, to the, the numbers that we have. Um, so, so when Trump is talking about this influx of the border and the surge of children who are detained, what's important to know, according to the information we have, is that it's not because more children are coming. It's because more, less children are being released from detention. So the reason we have a record high number of children in custody is because Trump is increasing the processing requirements for the family members. Um, and I just want to give you an example of a child that we represented to show you how difficult it is to get one child out and what it takes in our community to get one child out. So I uh, went to visit a rural Texas detention facility and I met a, a, a girl who goes by the pseudonym Daniela Marisol. And she chose that name because she said it represents the sea and the sun. And that's what she wanted her fake name to be in our lawsuit. Um, she's partially deaf. And when I met her in a rural Texas facility, she's like, I don't need your assistance, but I want to sign declarations about what I've witnessed here with other children because I think these, the conditions are horrible. She provided us with a critical declaration about what she witnessed with respect to forcible sedations and immigration policies. But she said, I don't need your help. Okay? So this was in October of last year. So, you know, we left the facility, um, filed some lawsuits um, about the, the deplorable conditions in that Texas facility. <coughs> Fast forward to May of 2018, I walked into a, rural, uh, a detention facility in Los Angeles and there was Daniela Marisol, <coughs> excuse me, and she said, I think I'm ready to have a lawyer now. <laughs> and I said, I bet you are. So Daniela told me that her own story, when she came across the, uh, the U.S.-Mexican border uh, from Honduras, uh, she was forcibly separated from her family and was civilly committed three times due to psychiatric meltdowns from being separated from her family. She didn't even know if they were alive. And she said there were weeks um, when she didn't hear from them, didn't know if they were alive. And uh, she unfortunately was civilly committed for about 11 days. Um, she was then transferred um, to a residential treatment facility where she got psychiatric care. And in the entire time she was detained, but for the last month, she had no treatment for her deafness. When we saw her again in May, uh, she signed a retainer agreement with our, we checked in with her family and they agreed to let her be the lead plaintiff in our class action against 
the forcible sedations of minors against the increased uh, detention times for minors with disabilities, and she sued under the, uh, the American with Disability Act. Um, she was very proud to do that. Um, so it, it, at this point, um, we said, well, we're going to get you out of here. So we called her family, and her sister said, well, I can't get her out. They won't let me because they say I have to have a two-bedroom apartment and a minimum of $500 balance in my checking account at any time. So we're like, okay, what are we going to do with that? I don't have that much money. <laughs> but we, we called a Jewish synagogue where her sister lived, and the Jewish synagogue in two days raised $5,000 for her. They got her a, not only a two-bedroom apartment, but they also furnished it um, and made, decorated Daniela Marisol's hopefully future bedroom. Um, uh, then when we went back to the federal government and said, we've got all the conditions met, they said, oh, no, you don't. We're going to add some more on. Uh, we want her to have a lawyer lined up, a free lawyer lined up in Minnesota. We also want her to have a free therapist with two, three weekly visits. And we want the entire family to redo their fingerprints. Um, we did all of that. And, they, and we said, okay, we've done it all. We've gotten everything you wanted. And they said, we want one more thing. Now we want a backup sponsor who's a US citizen. So, lo and behold, through our networking, found not only a backup sponsor who's a US citizen, but worked for NASA, formerly worked for NASA. <laughs> and I thought I was an advocate until I met Winnie. <laughs> and she pressed, she like went down and did her fingerprints, pressed the federal government every day for this child's release. Um, um, and then the federal government said, when I called them, now what? Now what excuse do you have? And they said, we can't tell you when this child will ever get out. And I thought, what? So we got a habeas lawyer. Habeas is when you sue the federal government to release and, and have a human being uh, liberated. Um, right after we found, the day we found that habeas lawyer, they released her. So last Friday, they released wow. Daniela Marisol. <laughs> But the point of that is not like, wow, that's so cool. The point of that is how depressing it is. That's what it takes to get one child out of federal custody. Um, and also what bravery it takes for one child to stand up and file a class action lawsuit. Uh, she just called me actually right before I was coming to speak. Uh, and she was uh, super excited because somebody had offered to donate her Target gift cards and she could go shopping, so she was really excited. Um, but uh, some of the work that our students uh, also did is that th this uh, last Thursday and Friday, uh, two of our law students, one of whom is a Honduran lawyer who's bilingual, another one, they went down to Tornillo, Texas, where there's a tent camp. Immigration, the federal government has created a tent camp for children. And in the tent camp, the numbers of children are over 1,100 children there. They're in tents. The only electricity is generated. There's no sewage. Um, the classroom is 100 students, children, to one teacher. How much does it cost per day to detain 1,100 children? Per child is $1,000 per day. All the employees, the 1,000 employees that work there are not from the El Paso Tornillo area. They're actually living in a hotel. So the federal government's also, that, that $1,000 of, of expenses includes uh, the overhead to fly in employees who are staying in hotels on a daily basis. Uh, so our students went out and uh, met with many of the children, not all the children, and got declarations. And we hoped to hold the government in contempt because this facility is in clear violation of the Flores Settlement Agreement. And it's clear that Trump's architecture includes expanding this. He's hoping to expand this to thousands and thousands of children, right? Um, and this is in part why he wants to dismantle our Flores Settlement Agreement, because it's not licensed. The education isn't in compliance with child welfare standards. Um, so last Friday, we filed a motion to hold the government in contempt. And one, one of the contempt powers could be putting someone in jail, which we're hoping for, but <laughs> I don't think it will happen, right? Um, but, uh, but hopefully it won't be me, right? Um, so, um, so anyway, we know that the federal government must be held accountable, and our students believe that they will be held accountable. Um, some of the other things our students have been working on are, are bonds. Uh, one, of the, one of the actions our students did was file a lawsuit to get bond amounts. And they discovered that there is 1.5 billion in open cash bonds, open cash bonds, uh, and 36 million in surety bonds that the immigrant community has paid. Um, and that's just in 2018. 
Um, some of the other work the students have done is work with children in foster care and uh, children who have been arrested on false gang allegations. We filed a class action last summer uh, where like throngs of children were re-arrested re by the federal government saying that these children are all in gangs. We actually won and the federal court said, go back into court and prove they're in gangs. And of the 30 kids, we got, all, we got 29 released. Um, so all of the charges were unsubstantiated. Um, so I just, I know that everybody came here to hear Matt Gonzalez. I did, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the, uh, I just wanted to conclude on this note, and that is that we're here in celebration of the Davis Vanguard. And that I think right now in this country, I wanna think that the, the change is in the courtrooms and that we're all looking to lawyers to maybe hold the government accountable. But it's really journalism, in my mind, is where uh, we need to invest. Um, <laughs> and journalism that also inquires and analyzes in new frameworks. And I think that I can appreciate that the Davis Vanguard, any time, almost every time I've gone uh, to them to help me advocate uh, for the most minimal protections, whether it be for a Cambodian refugee who's gonna be wrongfully deported, whether it be for a child who's being held in detention, the Vanguard has always covered the story. And in fact, when we got a pardon last year from the governor's office, they said, I don't know if we're gonna look into this and grant the pardon, show me what media attention you've got. So I was like, exhibit A. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's really, I think, without the oversight of the media and media that's responsible, um, that we cannot get past this administration. So I just really wanted to say thank you uh, to the journalists like yourself. Thank you, Holly, as someone uh, who I tremendously respect uh, hearing those words of praise means a whole lot. Um, so uh, there are others that I would like to thank uh, this evening as well, including uh, Davis Media Access, um, who have as sponsors uh, are filming this. Um, and so uh, we will be able to broadcast this on local media and we can also stream this on the web. Uh, so other people will be able to watch this as well. So um, I'm going to give uh, some brief remarks, and uh, I'm going to go a little bit off topic because uh, there are a few things that I have to say of interest. Um, but uh, the, the first thing is kind of... Uh, following on Holly's comments, and it's interesting the way it worked out because we didn't plan it this way, but uh, um, the Vanguard um, is really a unique organization, um, and, and we're a nonprofit, um, which I, I always joke, it means we don't have any money. Um, uh, the, the good news actually is that uh, this is the first year um, that uh, I've actually experienced where we're not paying our bills like two or three weeks after the start of the month when they were due. Um, we've actually had money in the bank so that we, we pay our, our bills for November and we still and we have all the money that we need for our December bills. So that's a weird feeling to have. <laughs> And a lot of that is due to um, our subscription program, which we've started in the last few years. Um, and you may think, well, you know, $10 a month, uh, how much good does that do? Well, um, you know, maybe one person giving $10 a month doesn't do a whole lot of good. But when you're talking about 200 to 250, then you're starting to talk about real money, and that's money that we can count on to come in every single month. So I don't have to, you know, on uh, November 1st, uh, try to raise $2,000 uh, to pay the rest of the bills. Um, we actually, again, have the money in the bank. Uh, so uh, as our inducement to get 
everyone here who is not already signed up to sign up. Uh, Danny, can you uh, hold up the uh, photograph in the back? So there's actually kind of a, a, a neat story of this photograph. Actually, can you come up front because it's hard for people to see. Sorry, I'm making you come up twice in front of people and I apologize. That probably, there's probably a workman's comp provision that I'm violating right now, um, which was, is, is something else interesting that uh, we've had to do. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, um, this uh, photo has an interesting story. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had a larger version of this um, uh, done up, and we presented it uh, myself and a, a man named Don Sherman who invented uh, sizzle picks. And we went before the council, and we gave it to uh, the city council. And I haven't seen where it's hanging, but supposedly it's hanging in City Hall, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, and, and this photo uh, is really completely accidental. There was a morning in July where my internet wasn't working. And uh, anyone who knows me, I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to, uh, to do my writing when it's nice and quiet. So about 3.30, 4 o'clock, I realized the internet's not working. Um, and so I drive down to my office uh, in downtown Davis, get everything written out. And um, it, it's right about sunrise. So I step out on the back balcony and I look out and I'm like, oh my God, it's raining outside. It's like July 13th and it's raining in Davis. Um, so I'm like, hey. Um, I wonder if I have a camera here. So I, I found my old camera and some old lens, and I walked down the street, and uh, I saw this scene with the clouds and everything, and I took the shot, and it came out. And so, you know, sometimes your Beck's photos are, are by complete accident. Okay, you can go sit down. So, <laughs> so anyone who signs up, uh, at $10 a month um, between now and December 31st. So you don't have to do it today. You can sign up online. Um, uh, enters to win the raffle. And then anyone who wants to actually just buy it outright uh, can, uh, can pay $200 and we'll, we'll have another one made and, and sent to you. Uh, so, so that's a way to donate to the Vanguard, and it's a way uh, to, uh, to make sure that we can continue to fund ourselves uh, into 2019. I can't believe it's going to be 2019. How did that happen? Um, so I, I want to tell you a quick story because there's a lady here in uh, the front uh, row, uh, and uh, Maria, can you stand up again? This is Maria Grijalva. Now, I'd like to tell you that this is the worst case I've ever seen here in Yolo County, but unfortunately, it's not even the worst case this week in Yolo County. Um, however, um, it's pretty bad. Um, she called me, I don't know, three or four weeks ago and told me, hey, I'm getting this uh, subpoena from the DA. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And, and she's like, well, they're looking at my 2016 city council bank records. And I'm like, well, why would the DA be doing that? Um, and so I, I talked to a bunch of people, and uh, I said, do you know of any uh, situation that you can remember? And I'm talking about people that go back, you know, 40, 50 years in this community who have been intimately involved in elections, and not one of them can remember a single time when the DA's office tried to prosecute somebody for a campaign violation. So I go away and I come back um, in early October and I think it was last week, everything's happened so quick. Um, uh, she said, uh, they're charging me. I'm like, they're charging you with what? Uh, she said, well, it's government code 85501. And so I do a quick search on 85501, which it turns out what, what she had done is she sent out um, a mailer uh, in West Sacramento for a candidate for, uh, for mayor. Uh, and, uh, and she spent, I don't know, $6,000? $6,000, okay, good sum of money, but it's in the scheme of everything in, in politics, $6,000 is like pennies, no offense. <laughs> um, and, so, and so it's like, 
what in the world are they doing? So I, uh, so I do some, uh, some searches and I find uh, this case out of San Jose and the mayor of San Jose, the former mayor, Chuck Reed, uh, had created this independent expenditure committee um, and he spent like $100,000, so 6000 versus 100000 Now keep these numbers in your mind because of what's going to happen next. So uh, uh, the FPPC, which is normally the body that investigates campaign violations, fines him for, for violating the independent expenditure law. He spends $100,000. Anyone want to care to guess exactly how much they fined him? $1. Now, why did they find him for one dollar? Well, they said, well, you know, he was trying, uh, made a good faith effort to comply with the law. He just didn't do it. Uh, so he challenges it in Sacramento Municipal Court, and they throw it out because it, because they rule that 85501 violates the Citizens United Supreme Court case. So if there's one good thing that comes out of <laughs> Citizens United, it's that Maria doesn't get prosecuted. Um, so, so then she goes into court this week and they announce, uh, to the shock of many, um, that, uh, they were throwing out the case. Now, now the question really is why in the world would the district attorney prosecute somebody? They were going to charge her with two misdemeanors, which, you know, may sound like a slap on the wrist, but it, it comes with potential jail time and all sorts of other things. Um, why would they do that? Well, it turns out that Maria donated a whole bunch of money to the guy who ran against the district attorney back in June. Now, does this smell a little funny? <laughs> I think so. Um, why, why, why did they drop the case? Why were they prosecuting the case? Oh, they won't answer that question. Um, uh, you know, they didn't answer it uh, when uh, Cress asked them. They did not answer it when the Sacramento Bee asked them. They didn't answer it when Fox 40 asked them. But, you know, like I said, uh, it, it, it's kind of suspicious. Um, so I want to tell you about this other case, and this one's a much older case. Um, but when I first started doing this back in 2006, I met a guy from... Clarksburg, actually, um, and his name was Khalid Bernie, and Ber uh, Khalid Bernie had a ranch. Um, on his ranch, I feel like I'm going to sing Old MacDonald, but uh, <laughs> on his ranch, uh, he had some goats, E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> um, this part's not so funny. Um, so apparently the goats got off his property and started roaming around and, uh, and may have caused some damage and, and whatnot. So what would you think that the fine for allowing your goats to run around would be? Well, apparently in Yolo County, the penalty for that is getting charged with misdemeanor counts. And so they charged him with, I believe, one misdemeanor count for each goat that got out. And so eventually he was charged with 170 misdemeanor charges. Again, this part's not so funny because he's facing 60 years in prison for allowing the goats to run, uh, run around at large. So he ends up hiring a guy named Mac Gonzalez, who may be in this room, um, and... Uh, Eventually, um, they, they catch a break because uh, anyone who knows Judge Fall, Judge Fall can be a real stickler, among other things, in his courtroom. And so he had made a whole bunch of rulings that made it really hard for them to defend the case. Um, but he ended up uh, recusing himself from the case. And uh, the DA made the decision to dismiss the charges, and so Khalid Bernie was able to go about his way. Um, so it, it's another interesting story. A lot of people tonight have asked, well, uh, why did I start the Vanguard? How did the Vanguard start? And I notice my wife's not in the back right now uh, because she'd be laughing. But, uh, but uh, early on, um, I... I had come into contact with a family, uh, uh, Halima Buzayan and her father, Jamal Buzayan, 
And as uh, people who have been in Davis for a while will, will recall, uh, Halima was involved in a bumper bender in the Safeway parking lot. Um, and the family claims, at least, that they were unaware that uh, they had made contact with another vehicle, but a witness reported seeing them at least uh, drive close to it, and they uh, thought they saw some damage on, on the bumpers. Um, they contacted, the, fa the family was contacted, and the family pay, uh, had other things going on, and so they paid for the damage, and they thought that that was the end of the story. Um, but a few weeks later, this, um, this daughter, who was at the time 16 years old, um, and they come on a school night, 10 o'clock at night, and uh, they arrest her uh, in her pajamas for a uh, bumper bender, hit and run, misdemeanor case. Um, and there were other things. Um, so, so the family was Muslim, and uh, the, th uh, the family believed uh, that uh, religious factors may have played a role. Um, then there was a whole bit where um, the investigating officer kind of ignored her plea for an attorney. Um, and then uh, later on, uh, when she filed the complaint against this officer, um, the, uh, the, the sergeant that took the complaint uh, tried to get her to confess to committing the crime, which is completely inappropriate. So eventually, the family hires Matt Gonzalez, who at the time was working uh, as, as a private attorney along with his partner, Whitney Lay, um, and they eventually get the case tossed out. And, and so, uh, as the result of this case and some other things that were happening at that time, I ended up forming the Vanguard as basically the way that I saw uh, to be able to tell what's actually going on in the community as opposed to uh, some of the other forms of media which I felt were not telling the full and accurate story. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Matt Gonzalez at the time was a private attorney. Um, so he's got an interesting history, um, very interesting for such a young guy. Um, so in 1999, he ran for district attorney in San Francisco. I didn't know this until I looked it up today. Uh, he finished third of the five candidates. Uh, but the next year, he won a seat um, on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and then in 2003, uh, he became the president of the Board of Supervisors. And uh, that same year, uh, he would run for mayor, and he ended up losing, but pretty narrowly, 53-47 to some guy I've never heard of. His name's Gavin Newsom. Um, and then in 2008, uh, he ran for vice president on Ralph Nader's ticket. So he's done a lot. Um, and then in 2011, he went back and uh, was hired as the chief attorney in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. And then, what was it, 2016, uh, he ended up as the lead attorney uh, defending a guy named Jose Zarate, in a case that everybody was uh, following because that, uh, that was the murder trial of uh, Kate Steinle. Um, and so he ended up uh, on national news for several months as that trial went on, and he was able to gain an acquittal on the main charge, um, which, which was pretty amazing considering everything uh, that had transpired. So I'd like to introduce, without any further ado, uh, Matt Gonzalez. It's, uh, it's always difficult to hear about all my political defeats. <laughs> um, I've run four times and won one race. In baseball, that wouldn't be very good average. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I grew up in a, a town in South Texas, McAllen, Texas, and uh, you're not missing anything, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I grew up in South Texas, in McAllen, Texas, and um, 
I became an attorney and I started work in the public defender office in San Francisco. And I spent about a decade doing that work before, uh, as David mentioned, I ran for district attorney. Um, I ran because I had represented a young person in a marijuana case um, and the district attorney, who was considered the most progressive district attorney in the United States, wanted jail time for a kid that was basically smoking pot on some steps on Haight Street, um, which was against the law back then. <laughs> Not anymore. But, uh, and so in negotiations with the district attorney, the head of the narcotics unit, it was actually an attorney that had smoked pot in my house at a, <laughs> at a party. And it was very interesting because the defense attorneys, the public defenders, weren't smoking pot, and all the DAs that came through were. And so he's telling me how they're going to have to make an example of this young person. He was like 23 years old and was going to college. He had no priors. And the judge, who's now on the Ninth Circuit, very conservative judge, did in fact sentence the defendant to jail. And at the time I said, if you do this, I'm going to spend all of my resources telling people what you're doing. I mean, I'll take out ads in the paper, I'll go on the radio, I'll run for district attorney, I mean, I'll do whatever it takes. So the next day I was in a courtroom and that attorney walked through the head of the narcotics unit. He says, well, you better get your filing money together. And it was really just an insult. Uh, so I did and I ran and, and his boss uh, had to listen to me at all these various debates. Uh, explain to him what they were doing wrong. Uh, I was elected the next uh, year to the City Council of the Board of Supervisors. I was a member of the Green Party and a couple of years later became the president of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I was not expected to win the mayor's race that I got into and in many respects I was not a very good politician. I, um, I uh, had closed my bank account after being elected to the Board of Supervisors and when we were making planning decisions, I would often get checks from some of the parties that were appearing before me, and it would be so weird. It was like, why are they sending me money? But it, they just understood that that's what you did. You're supposed to pay your respects to the politicians by giving them, you know, $500 for their next race or something like that. We would just send it back, of course, my office. Um, but um, I thought getting elected mayor might be easier than having to put together eight out of 11 votes to override a mayoral veto. And that's what motivated me to run. I got into a runoff with very um, uh, low vote totals. I had about 19, 20% of the totals. Uh, it was a wide field and Newsom had uh, over 40%, I think 42%. So he was expected to win and it became a very close race. Unfortunately, there were a lot of progressive allies uh, labor unions, et cetera, who as they tried to assess who they should support, they basically went with him because he was going to win. And in the week before the election, they started saying, oh man, if we knew it was going to be this close, we might have done this different. Uh, and probably my uh, greatest uh, injury in politics was when the uh, a union representing janitors that I had marched with endorse my opponent, you know, even though all the guys in the room knew me because the, uh, the heads of the union in Sacramento told them to, to do that. Um, I uh, returned to private practice. I didn't seek re-election to the Board of Supervisors. I started a progressive law firm. It was a bunch of lefties, you know, Green Party, uh, you know, attorneys, about six, seven, eight of us. At the peak, we filed lawsuits against district attorneys, against police, against grand juries, against you know, businesses like Comcast and national hotels not paying the minimum wage. We, didn't, we got into big fights that we didn't have the resources to fully do, but we had some attorneys that were so talented that they could you know, single-handedly fight entire law firms. Um, I, wanna, I wanna tell the story of some of these cases uh, in Davis because it's it's really just shocking and I'll remind remind you David in 2006 there was a group called Carol that was trying to um, Advocate for citizen oversight of the police department I wrote an opinion editorial with my law partner at the time that was published in the Davis Enterprise Defending the right to speak anonymously 
because the police were trying to go on chat rooms and try to figure out who was behind the citizens' effort at oversight and try to figure out where the money was coming from. So there are a lot of us that have participated, as you are doing, to make this community more progressive. And, you know, I think we're all in it together. Um, the case you mentioned, I, wa I want to just talk about Khalid's case, the uh, GOAT case, because it's a fascinating uh, uh, example of obvious um, bias. Um, he was represented by another attorney that was urging him to take a plea deal. He came to us and asked us if we would handle it. I was worried that if we took the case over, the judge would want us to go to trial like that day because we were substituting in his counsel on trial date. But we got ready. I showed up. I think it was Judge Fall. And uh, they were extremely hostile to somebody representing, uh, you know, his case. And I remember when I appeared in front of him, he said, uh, okay, I understand you're going to be the new attorney on the case. Is that correct? And I said, yes. My name's Matt Gonzalez. I'm going to file a general appearance on the case. And the first thing he said to me was, I'm sorry, counsel, did you mean to say, yes, your honor? And I said, no, actually, I meant to say yes, which is what I said. <laughs> and, and that's literally how it started. But this is what happened to Khalid. He was actually, he had gone to, he was Muslim. He had gone to one of the California agricultural schools and was very interested in state-of-the-art technology. He was married to a you know, California, Caucasian, blonde-haired woman. They were a great couple. They had kids. They were super happy, just law-abiding people. Uh, and they had the best fencing for goats in this entire region. But goats are pretty crafty. And <laughs> these guys would charge the fencing and get through it. Not a big deal. You have dogs to round them up. It's a rural area anyway. And rounding them up is just, a, it's just something you have to do as a goat rancher. Well, Khalid had a problem, which was there was a crop dusting um, operation nearby. And if the planes came in too low, the goats would be frightened and charge the fencing. And so that was actually what was causing them to get out of this state-of-the-art electronic fencing. Um, Typically, it's like getting a parking ticket. It's an administrative code violation. They just write a ticket and you probably pay, I don't know, $5 per goat, or, I mean, if anybody even cares. Um, in this case, they did criminally prosecute him for over 100 uh, violations. Uh, we brought a motion, it's called a Murgia motion, that shows discriminatory prosecution, and, and every other goat rancher, Caucasian goat rancher, came forward to sign declarations that in the same time period they had had their goats get out more often than him and had never been prosecuted, never even had a ticket written, and we were able to subpoena those records. And ultimately it was dismissed when we made these allegations. Judge Fall denied that motion, and we threatened to make it as a trial defense when the DA gave up. Um, another case we handled was the young woman, Halima's case, uh, juvenile, charged in a hit and run. What had happened was her mother with her brothers, uh, mother and, and the mother's uh, sons had gone to the supermarket, I think it was raining or something, and uh, in parking the vehicle she bumped another car. Um, they didn't pay any attention to it, it wasn't like a big deal, this was a super minor situation. She went home and I guess someone had written down her um, license plate and the police came and told her what had happened. She said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I mean, this is a wealthy family. They're, they've got, you know, good, solid jobs. I mean, they've never been in trouble at all. And she's like immediately like, oh my God, give me the information. I'm so sorry. I'm absent-minded. I was on the way home to get dinner, et cetera, et cetera. She immediately contacted the other party, paid for it, the whole thing. The cops got it in their head that her daughter was driving because whoever saw it thought it was a younger person. Um, and the, 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 the son said that that wasn't true, the mother, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and literally, that got criminally prosecuted. When I appeared in court with my law partner, Whitney Lay, African-American from Chicago, uh, we had met in law school, great, just a brilliant lawyer, the best legal writer I've ever uh, been, in, been with. 
we appeared in front of this judge and um, he was very unhappy that we were there and so he started with this sort of like okay well when are you coming back for the for the pretrial conference and we said well what about the 16th no that's too far away okay how about the 12th I'm not available on the 12th. Okay, how about the 11th? How about the 10th? I mean, I put out five or six dates. Then I said, well, Your Honor, why don't you select a date and we'll be here, you know? I just said it like that. And he said, you know, counsel, I don't appreciate you talking to me like that. He says, why don't we do this? I'm going to put the matter over till tomorrow and we can pick a date tomorrow. Now, he was doing that because he knows we're driving to San Francisco and have to come back. And I appeared on a lot of cases in Davis where... That was the deal. Uh, they would call my case last. If I walked out of the courtroom, they'd try to call it. Uh, when I wasn't there using the bathroom or something like that, it was really quite ugly. And I represented the head of the housing authority, David uh, Serena, um, who had a high-performing agency. When he traveled, they shared rooms and slept on the floor. I mean, he worked with Cesar Chavez back in the old days. And the Republican grand jury kept issuing reports saying it was a low-performing agency and alleging that he was misusing mon monies and staying in lavish hotels. And we contacted them and said, look, before you issue your report, because you did it last year and you did it the year before, in the year before that, why don't you just tell the truth? I mean, here are the documents. None of this is true. You keep putting out this false information. What was going on was it was all Republicans selected by Republican judges and conservative Democrats, and they were, in effect, trying to undermine him because he was building housing for poor people. So we filed a lawsuit against the Superior Court and the uh, grand jury in this county, in Yolo County, and just said, you can't do it. The way you're picking grand jurors is like your friend. There are no Latinos on the grand jury. It's just, uh, it's just completely discriminatory. Um, the next week, they filed, I don't know, 40-something charges against David for misappropriation of public monies, all felonies. What had he done? Well, he had um, a girlfriend who he later married, and she had two children, minor children, and they were getting medical and dental benefits via his employment with the county. And so they had decided, I, I think they'd been to the dentist one time, they'd gone to the doctor you know, a couple times, and they decided this was criminal activity. So um, fortunately for us, we had filed a lawsuit against the Superior Court, so they recused themselves because they were being sued. And they had to bring in a judge, lucky for us, from Berkeley, California. <laughs> <laughs> you know how this turns out. And. Uh, they put a, a death penalty prosecutor on the case who was extremely rude. And uh, um, I just said, look, they're, they're, a, they're, a crime has not occurred. We're not going to plead guilty to something. And at the preliminary hearing, we were able to show, I forget if it was the medical or the dental benefits, but one of the benefits, in fact, the law did allow these children to get the benefit from him because they were living in his house. And as to the other benefit, they were not entitled to get it. However, my point was, he never lied in the application. The county gave him the benefit. He told the truth. He says, no, I'm not married to their mother. They're living in my house, whatever, whatever. I said, your mistake doesn't make it a crime. He just applied for the benefit, and you gave it to him. That's your problem, and if you want him to pay you back, you know, a couple hundred dollars, ask him. And that was that. Um, let me tell you a couple of things. It, you know, I know everyone's been sitting a long time, and. If you're bored, by all means, leave. <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm, I, all these memories are coming back because we really litigated these cases and we cared very deeply about trying to do the right thing. We handled other cases here. I don't recall any of them resulting in a conviction. So um, it turned out pretty well. Um, the Garcia Zarate case that I handled, um, you know, just kind of swept up in the, uh, in the, it, with media attention because of our current president. You may not recall, but he had, um, that. well, you, you recall this, but not the time period with the case I handled. He, he had announced he was running for president after coming down the escalator at uh, Trump Towers, and he disparaged Mexicans and, he, and Mexican immigrants and saying, you know, they're not sending their best people, et cetera. Everybody laughed him off. This was a joke candidacy. 
Well, two or three weeks later, Kate Steinle dies on Pier 14, a populous tourist location in San Francisco. Young, beautiful, her whole life ahead of her, and she's with her father when she gets shot in the back. It seems completely senseless. And uh, my client, uh, Jose Ines Garcia Zarate, in his 40s, is arrested. He had been deported, oh, I don't know, about five times. He had seven felony convictions. And so Trump started talking about his case and talking about what a terrible fellow this was. And um, uh, I was in Colorado when the elected public defender, Jeff Adachi, called me up and said, hey, we've got this case. Will you take this case? Uh, and he was wondering if I had bandwidth because I was handling another uh, serious murder case at the time. And I said, sure, I'll do it. All we knew at the time was, you know, he had shot this woman at point blank range is what we understood. And he had confessed to it to a TV camera that weekend. And so I went to see him. I flew back the next day. I, w I went to see him. And immediately I could see there were some mental health issues going on. Very simple. Uh, but he had no violence in his background. No, no history of any kind of violence. And he just, he didn't know uh, Catherine Steinle. He had no reason to hurt her. This was not like a robbery gone bad. He never committed a robbery. He never committed a theft. This guy was just not the way he was being portrayed. And so we were able to show pretty clearly, um, it, but it was hard to get the media to, 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 to hear this, that the, uh, he was seated on the pier when the gun was fired. The bullet struck about 12 feet where, from where he was and traveled another, I believe it was 70 or 80 feet before it struck Steinle in the back. It's a totally freak occurrence. You could not, you could be an expert marksman and not be able to ricochet a bullet off concrete and accurately hit someone that far away. He got up and, and split and that was kind of, that, that was the case. Um, I started realizing that his prior convictions were actually very minor when you broke them down. And I want to talk to you a little bit about them because one of the takeaways is how bad immigration law is and how things like Sanctuary City and Kate's Law get wrapped up into a narrative that, you know, it's like it doesn't fit. This isn't the right case to be dealing with national legislative solutions. And here's why. He had, in the early 1990s, while he was up in the state of Washington, he had some what were uh, drug cases. Today, they would all be misdemeanors. They were basically drug possession. However, in like 1993, he pled guilty to one for uh, possession for sale. Now, the, the report, I read it, he had no money on him, and there was residue in a plastic baggie. The police thought he was in a drug transaction. They offered him, a, I don't know, credit for time served deal. If he pled guilty for a possession for sale, he pled to It's not a big deal. He already had a, some felonies. And these were, this is drug activity in between his laborer jobs and out of season while he's just trying to survive. Well, the federal law, it's 8 U.S.C. 1326. Chuck mentioned this statute because it relates to illegal entry into the United States. And I want to break it down for you like this. If you come from Mexico to the United States without documentation, you're going to get deported. Maybe you'll be in custody for a little bit before they deport you. Maybe you'll get six months or a year. Maybe if you're a repeat offender, they'll hold you for a couple of years. But that's pretty much, that's it. You know, the, the, it's, the universe is relatively, you know, you know what it is. However, if you have been deported on what's called an aggravated felony, murder, rape, all the sex crimes, explosives, right? You're gonna do your jail time in the United States, then you're gonna be deported. And if you come back to the United States, you're facing 20 years. And it's not a joke, like you'll get a lot of jail time. Okay, that kind of makes some sense. If you did a serious crime here, we really don't want you back. Problem is, Aggravated felony includes murder, rape, all those offenses, and any amount of drug trafficking. So any marijuana felony 
the sale or possession for sale, any small amount of any other contraband, means that Garcia Zarate, when he pled guilty for possession for sale for virtually no jail time to some residue in a bag, he's now facing 20 years every time he comes here. First time he came, they negotiated it, five-year sentence. He appeared in court, I think, two times. Did his five years, they deported him, he came back for work. Because, you know, in certain parts of Mexico, there's really extreme poverty. Uh, they catch him. He's committed no crime other than en entering. They negotiate six years. He does six years, gets deported, comes back. They offer him seven years this time. So he does five, six, seven, okay? Part of why he keeps coming back is he doesn't understand why he's getting the jail time because he's got like some cognitive issues. And so he doesn't understand like what he did to merit this and so he's not changing his behavior. So um, the feds are about to deport him but San Francisco has an old warrant for him. It's 20 year old marijuana case and they've ignored it every other time they've deported him. But this time they bring him to San Francisco. San Francisco uh, he appears in a courtroom, they dismiss it immediately, and the feds don't uh, pick him up because the San Francisco sheriff wants there to be a legitimate uh, warrant or uh, probable cause document from the courts to release him to the feds. The feds don't get the document. San Francisco actually holds him in custody for about two or three weeks without any legal reason. And finally, they just let him out in the street. Goes out on the street, he's just living on the Embarcadero, he's wearing clothes he found. Uh, they won't hire him in the Mexican restaurants, but they feed him a little bit. He doesn't beg for money, he doesn't steal. He, he literally, he looks so poor when people are walking by in an affluent tourist area that people just give him their leftover dinners that they're taking home, they're like, oh my God, would you like this? That's literally how he's surviving. And he does that for about three months before this incident happens. And he swears up and down he found a gun at the seat that he sat down on the pier, wrapped up in something. He investigated it and it fired the bullet. And that's what he said. Now, it was hard for people to believe that you could actually find a gun on the pier wrapped up. But then stop and think about it. We have you know, over 100 million guns um, in our society. I mean, it's, it's a crazy number. There are accidental shootings that happen every day. I think it's something like 40 every day. Somebody dies. I think the number's three people die every two days from an accidental shooting. So. It turned out we were able to get some surveillance footage from about, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away from a, a fire boat. It was grainy, but it revealed something very significant, which was before Garcia Zarate sat down at that chair, there was a congregation of about six, seven people. They had a knapsack or a bag with them. They were talking, they were there, they were together for about 20 minutes. They weren't tourists. This is a pier that everybody walks onto, walks down to the end, looks at the site and walks off, which is what Catherine Steinle was doing with her father. Garcia Zarate didn't do that because he's just a homeless guy sitting on a chair swiveling around. But these people could very well have been discarding a gun. Now why would they discard the gun? It turned out to belong to a Bureau of Land Management ranger who had left it unsecured in his vehicle and it had been stolen a few days earlier. And we argued very clearly that Garcia Zarate had no history for stealing. He had not tried to offer any object for sale in the preceding days that he was arrested. And um, I mean, I, th I don't even think he had 10 cents in his pocket. And there were other things of value stolen from the vehicle, laptop computers, credit cards, all kinds of stuff. There were many things that happened during the trial that frustrated us because I felt the judge wanted a different outcome. He, was a Schwarz he is a Schwarzenegger appointment, and um, he did a lot of things that um, we think uh, resulted in Garcia Zarate not getting a fair trial. Now, he was found not guilty of the murder and manslaughter charges, and that's why it was celebrated as a big victory. But he was convicted of gun possession, and I'll give you an idea of 
why th that shouldn't have happened. Basically, the, the judge would not instruct the jury on this idea of a momentary possession. And think of it this way. If I hand you a bag and you don't know what's in it, and you say, what's this? And I say, oh, have a look. And you open it, look in it, and there's contraband in there, and you put it on the ground, you say, I don't want this, you hand it back to me. Have you committed the crime of possessing that contraband? Well, I think the answer is no. You didn't know, you had no knowledge. And uh, if you, once you had knowledge, and it was in your hand, the only possession you had was to get rid of it. Well, that was what we were trying to explain to the judge, that look, Garcia Zarate did not know it was a gun. He's handling it. It fires. At that moment, the jury says, well, it is in his hands. Is he guilty of possession? And they asked for instructions from the judge, and he would not properly instruct them on the law. There were a lot of other things that happened. The, the Bureau of Land Management officer was allowed to testify to all the safety precautions he took, but it the judge wouldn't let us tell the jury that he actually had a second loaded firearm in the car, also not secured properly, that had not been stolen, things like that. And one of the things that in the course of this trial that was most frustrating was that the firearm that he had was an elite firearm that can be fired with a very low trigger pull. The, fact the factory trigger pull of this gun when it's in single action mode is like 4.4 pounds. And this is a gun without a safety. It's meant for law enforcement to be able to reach for this gun and start firing, not to be messing around with the safety. This is a gun you have as a secondary weapon that you reach for if you're in trouble. That's the, that's the concept. It's a very well made firearm. But it's got a very light trigger pull. So we um, were trying to demonstrate how low the trigger pull was to the jury, and we were making a simulator that couldn't actually fire a bullet but would allow a jury to test the simulator. Uh, we had a firearms expert in Canada making the simulator, and we told the court about it. We weren't in possession of it yet, but it was in the mail to us, and we told them when we got it, we would turn it over to the DA. They could test it and the whole thing. Well, the DA was very upset, so there was no simulator, we're going to object if the jury should see the real gun. So we said, fine, let them test the trigger pull on the real gun. The judge said, great, we're, we're all in agreement. Well, a few days later, the DA changes her mind. Before I can even be heard on the subject, the judge agrees with her. And so the DA argued to the jury that 4.4 that pounds is like lifting a five pound bag of sugar. That's what it takes to fire this gun. When the truth was squirt guns, our expert tested some children's squirt guns at, at trigger pulls of like four pounds. I mean, this is a very light trigger pull. And um, you know, this was the kind of gamesmanship that was happening in court. Anyway, I could go on and on. I, let me just say a couple of other things about the law, I, I mentioned this idea of this illegal reentry based on the aggravated felony. I want to just say about Sanctuary City. I think it, it hurts us when everybody is presenting Sanctuary City as a municipality fighting the federal authority and that we want to have our own laws and we don't have to follow what the feds are doing. And I don't, I don't think that that works because we're a nation of laws and that seems to make sense to people. They don't understand what are we going to do, be ruled by local authorities when there's, you know, federal law? And here's why that argument is wrong. What has happened in a 10-year period, it was, it was uh, proven that ICE and Homeland Security uh, arrested 1,500 U.S. citizens by mistake. They put detainers on them. They would call the sheriff of a county and say, put a detainer on that person. We're going to deport them. Turned out they got it wrong 1,500 times in that time period. So the courts in uh, Nevada, uh, North Dakota, Rhode Island, uh, I think uh, Utah, a number of different places said, no, 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 you can't do it that way. You have to present probable cause, a warrant, uh, a probable cause instrument that says this person's not a citizen and subject to deportation. 
we have to see that before the municipality does what you want. That's what's actually going on. It's the federal authorities, ICE and Homeland Security, that don't want to follow federal law. It's the municipality that's following federal law because federal law gets interpreted by the courts. And that's really the fight. The final thing I want to say is, you know, I was thinking about why is it that immigration is such a hot topic right now? Like, why is it that there's so many people here in this country that appear to be here without documentation? Like, was it always this way? When I was growing up, was it this way? It just seems so peculiar that this is so much a thing. And it turns out that in 1952, um, there was a national immigration law that was passed that changed something in the law that is causing the problem that we have now. And it relates to something in law that we call statute of limitations. So when you commit a crime, typically you have to be prosecuted for it within a certain amount of time. So like let's say, unless it's murder, right? There's no statute of limitations on the crime of murder, but let's say you commit a misdemeanor. Some states you have to be prosecuted within a year or within three years. Some states with felonies have three-year statute of limitations. Some maybe go to five years. And what this means is I could admit to doing a crime 10 years ago, hey, I stole that stuff from you when we were roommates. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it. You can't prosecute me for it. It's just too many years ago. Well, this law in 1952 changed the statute of limitations for illegally entering the country. Because that's the crime, right? You illegally entered the country without documentation. So the clock starts the day you entered. And let's say five years later, they can't prosecute you for it. Now, you're not a citizen, so you have to apply to become a citizen. But the law had a built-in amnesty. What did the law do? The law changed the statute of limitations not to start running from when you entered, but to start running from when you were discovered here without documentation, which meant you never obtained amnesty, and that's why you've had this proliferation of these cases. Anyway, I've talked enough. It's a real delight to be back, and to David and Cecilia, I really appreciate everything you guys have done, because from the very outset, I mean, you guys just took on so much. You were always supportive. Anytime we needed anything, they were there 100%, and congratulations on, on this event and everything you've done. Thank you. So we do have a little bit of time for audience questions, and uh, there are mics on the side of uh, the room. Um, try to actually ask a question if you're interested rather than making a statement, um, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but if you have a question, uh, you can get up behind the mic and uh, and ask it, or if you just want to go, then that's fine too. <laughs> so I don't know. Does anyone have a I question? Got a question. No. Okay, perfect. For uh, Mr. Gonzalez, if you don't okay. mind. Uh, there's a scenario going on right now in Guatemala where we have like seven or eight thousand um, Guatemalans or whatever's going on in those central countries that may be reaching the border within the next two to three weeks, and the dummy. And the White House has has sent like 800 troops to the border. They may not all get there, the seven or eight thousand, but some of these people are going to wind up at the border. From my understanding, you know, they're escaping a, a life of uh, crime being committed against them. What happens there once they get to the border? Well, I I think for me, I'm most interested in the kind of rhetoric of how these folks are perceived because, you know, it's very different, like the way you think of like illegal immigration, you know, undocumented people coming here, when you understand that they're fleeing American foreign policy decisions, then you get it. Like there's like literally the tens of thousands of guns that we have sold into Mexico contributing to, to the, the rampant crime there and the drug cartels. Or you take something like NAFTA where you've got you know, our subsidizing of American corn 
so it can be sold for less than it can be grown in Mexico means that you're putting Mexican farmers out of work. And it starts to feel different about why are they are coming. And I think, you know, I'm not an expert in foreign policy, but I think the same argument goes for folks coming from Central America. So many of those nations are ravaged by, you know, certainly the 20th century United States, um, you know, really undermining of democratic regimes, et cetera, there. What's going to happen when they get here? I mean, folks can come and, and uh, make application for asylum. I think that that's going to be the process. The question of whether or not Trump's tactics of trying to harm people physically and mentally to, to injure them so much that they give up. I mean, I don't know how that plays out. Uh, I am bothered that a rule like illegal reentry for an aggravated felony that applies to any amount of marijuana sale has been on the books for, God, two, three decades. I mean, ever since I've been a lawyer, and even the Democrats have not stood up to change that law. Sure, hi. Um, I wonder if you could advise us in the Vanguard or any tonight about concrete things we can do. Like, it's disturbing to read the story about Maria. What do we do? I think um, I, last year we knew what to do. We worked for a new public defender and we came, I mean, district attorney, and we came close. But what do we do this year? Well, one thing I like to do is I like to write the truth, and I like to put people's names in those articles and make them read about the injustices that they're engaged in, because it bothers them. And when, <laughs> when, when their friends or they, they Google themselves, these articles are out there in the world. And I'll tell you, we had some public defenders run for judge, and... Um, uh, in San Francisco. It's very hard to beat incumbents, but they ran against conservative judges. And the judges were sitting Court of Appeal judges and a state Supreme Court judge basically got out there and were writing, uh, you know, letters and editorials to the legal paper saying what an outrage it was. And every lawyer should oppose this kind of attack on the judiciary. It was all rubbish, right? But one of the judges that signed on to a letter was a Supreme Court judge, Democratic appointed, uh, who basically taught at Stanford. I mean, my alma mater. He never even did a deposition. He'd never tried a case. And it was like, you know, I wrote an article that in part basically said to him, you're not even as qualified as these people. Like, shut up, you know. And I didn't say it that way, but the point was made, which was, you know, this is, this is a democracy. People are running for office. If you don't want judicial elections, then change the Constitution. That's the way the law, and you're supposed to uphold the law, not attack it, you know, and that sort of thing. So I think it's very effective. That's just something you have to do. You'll get better at writing things. My writing has gotten better. You may be a great writer to start with, but I just mean, you know, and you, whether you, whether you publish it in the newspaper or you create your own places to publish it, People read it and find it, and it gets circulated. Everybody knows the details of what's happening to somebody, and they can join forces, and, and the powers that be feel the pressure. Hi, my name is Desiree Rojas, and I'm a resident of Davis. Um, for many years, we have been fighting this DA, Jeff Rising. He attacked Maria Grijalva. We are part of the community that um, that supported Maria, and thank God they dropped the, um, I guess it was a complaint. <laughs> um, so in, in the press conference that we had before she entered the courthouse, uh, we stated in our press statement that we uh, are demanding that uh, Javier um, Becerra, uh, the uh, attorney general, to conduct expeditiously uh, uh, an investigation into prosecutorial misconduct. And so my question is, is what can we do to really put the pressure on him to do his job to get this DA to start the investigation? Well, I think the state attorney general has a good reputation. And um, I don't know him personally. I've heard him speak. Um, but Personally, I like when, 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 
you know, a lot of times people in authority hide behind the strict reading of the law to say, well, I'm just, you know, uh, charging you with a crime that you may have committed and it looks like you committed. A very powerful tool is the case I mentioned earlier, the Mergia case, which basically allows you to get your case dismissed if you can show discriminatory prosecution. And in this case, you have a Latina woman um, who is being singled out. The question is, is there anybody of any other category, you know, in terms of gender or race, that they have not criminally prosecuted, that they could have for the very same thing? It's a very powerful tool, and it's been used, I've used it successfully um, to allege that, hey, why are you only arresting the Latino guys selling drugs in the, in the city square and not the African Americans or Caucasian guys who have a marijuana club around the corner or whatever? Or, you know, out at San Quentin, there would be fights in the jail and only the African American guys would get prosecuted in the county courthouse. The Caucasian guys that got in fights, ah, oh, it's an administrative matter, we'll deal with it in house. That's a Mergia motion. And what Mergia does is it gives you, if you can make a showing that there appears that there might be discrimination here, you can ask to subpoena and to make the prosecution turn over the records that you need to prove your situation. So for instance, in the, in, the, in the marijuana case, a Latino arrested in a drug case, I put together a declaration with the names of 40 or 50 other guys being charged for the same offense, all of whom were Latino. So I was saying, okay, here I've shown you all the guys being prosecuted. I want to see the records, like show me who's being arrested so I can figure out why you're not prosecuting them. And uh, so that's worth asking a lot of questions and, and trying to sort that out. And if you've got a district attorney that has run for office, I would scrutinize his own campaign finances, you know? Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, you said a few minutes ago that local mu municipalities want to obey the laws, but it's the feds that don't, and it's pretty obvious. We know that. So I'm trying to understand the mentality, and this is a pattern throughout the Trump administration, not just locally with, uh, or with immigration issues, but I'm trying to understand this whole thing that they do, not wanting to follow the laws. Is it because they think, uh, well, first of all, it's arrogance, we know that, and it's a lot of other things, but do they think we're gonna push it until someone sues us, or do we think, They're or gonna, do they think yeah. the laws don't apply to them, or do they think, what's this mentality? Well, yeah. It's pervasive. Well, they're bullies fundamentally, yeah. Yeah. and what they're doing is they're gonna put pressure to make Congress change the law. So, or to get judges on the bench that aren't gonna agree with those other judges. And what they're doing is they're basically saying, rather than follow the law, we're gonna ignore it, and every time someone like Catherine Steinle gets hurt, we're just gonna blame the municipality. And eventually, people are gonna get so upset that the law's gonna change, you know? They, they, they have the long view, and they're willing to let a lot of people get hurt in the process, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight, and thank you to all our speakers and everybody who uh, spent their time here. Thanks. <laughs>